and we're live. Welcome back, everyone, to another ReadZ Live, ReadZ's ongoing series of webinars where we bring on professionals from the world of publishing uh, to show you how to write and publish better books. Uh, following on from our last webinar two weeks ago where we brought on John Oliver, not that one, uh, uh, a publisher and editor uh, specializing in genre fiction, uh, we're going to sort of broaden things out uh, and talk about basically all sorts of publishing, but from the perspective of uh, two authors who I have with me today. Uh, Long-time viewers uh, will recognize Caroline Levitt and Gina Sorrell. Uh, they are two editors here on the ReadZ platform, uh, ready to work with you guys if you need to, but they are also fantastic authors in their own right. Uh, Gina uh, ha is, I think, uh, on the cusp of publishing her second novel next year, so she's relatively new to the game. Uh, whereas uh, Caroline has uh, published 12 books. She'll tell you this, I'm ruining their backstory. Um, but she comes with a lot of experience and between them, like they know so much about uh, publishing, uh, what it is to be a published author, the editorial side of things, the process side of things. Uh, they're just gonna have a good old chat and um, reveal basically what they know about publishing from their perspective uh, throughout. There are gonna be questions answered, but don't worry, you, uh, you sit tight, we'll bring them on in just a minute. Uh, in the meantime, let us know uh, where you're calling from. We've got Carmen from Massachusetts and Natalie from Ottawa. Oh, very nice. Uh, we are, I found from doing all these Reedsy Lives that we are very well represented uh, north of the border over uh, in North America. Uh, we have quite a lot of people sort of on the East Coast, quite a lot of Floridians that I tend to notice. Claudia from Toronto, uh, and then a good chunk of people from uh, over here, this side of the Atlantic. And, and then a, a smattering of folks from a bit further west, the Indian subcontinent. Uh, and maybe if they're waking up early, we get a few folks from Australia and New Zealand. But welcome, everybody. Terry says, love the t-shirt. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's a, sort of a modern art print. It shames me that I don't know uh, what it is exactly. But uh, yeah, it's uh, summer now. So this is my summer outfit. Heather from Yorkshire in the UK. Welcome, Heather. Uh, we have Deandra from Malta. Uh, home of that village they built for the film Popeye that apparently is still there. Uh, Peter, retired, a Brit living in the Dominican Republic. Okay, fantastic. We're just letting people uh, crawl in. Uh, I'll bring on Gina and Caroline in just a few minutes. Uh, but, you know, they're a bit shy. The only thing that really make them come out and speak to you guys uh, is if you like this video, uh, maybe even subscribe to Readsy. Uh, the channel here, we have webinars every two weeks. Uh, and also brand new videos from Shailen, our YouTuber. Uh, she put that uh, she puts that out uh, twice a week normally. Though I believe we're soon going to have uh, quite a big series in which she'll release longer form content. Uh, I could probably tease it here. She's uh, going to be talking about uh, editing uh, a little bit in the future. So if you're interested in the whole self-editing and editing process, definitely subscribe. Uh, there'll be some good stuff there. Anyway. Uh, I see we've got a good chunk of folks uh, still pouring in, but you know what? Let's bring our guests on. Uh, a big welcome, everyone, uh, to uh, Caroline and Gina. How are you both? Hi. We're just great. Thank you. We're Hi. Terrific. Thank you. Well, I think you're nice. very nice to say that we're shy. I know. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's an old uh, uh, pantomime trick. Uh, they have British Panther pizza, which is like, oh, they're really shy. you got to really clap hard for them to come on. <laughs> it's a way to just generate applause, or in our case, a great idea. likes. Right. Uh, Super idea. So, uh, Caroline, uh, are you, you still in New York City right now? I'm just outside of New York City, in New York City's unofficial sixth borough, Hoboken, New Jersey. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's a warm, sunny, beautiful day. Well, you know, you're, you're about to, you know, you're due for some good weather. And Gina, are you still in yes. Canada? Yes, I'm in Toronto. And it's also an absolutely gorgeous state, which is wonderful news because unfortunately we've gone into our third lockdown for 28 days. Oh. So I'm getting to know my backyard intimately. And I'm very grateful that I have a backyard. But, you know, I never knew that I could rearrange the same furniture so often. <laughs> I, I, I gotta say, yeah, you're very lucky on that front because uh, I live in a very lucky. apartment here in London. And uh, when it first locked down last year, I think it was like the hottest summer we'd have for quite a while and we couldn't go anywhere. So I was just in this flat boiling myself alive. Absolutely. I have family in England. And so I know they're very excited now to start to be able to actually get out, which is great. I know. Go and see stuff. Uh, anyway, but everyone's been writing in quarantine. So we're very excited to share, you know, 
our yes, information with them and see what everybody's <laughs> been up to because we've lots of people have been getting those thoughts onto pages, which is great. That's great. Um, so just to let everyone at home know what the sort of arrangement is going to be, I'm going to pop off in a second. So if you don't like me, you're going to love this next section. Uh, but I'll be <laughs> looking at the questions. Uh, and as Gina and Caroline uh, talk, if there's any relevant questions, I'll make sure they see it and perhaps they'll answer it. But there also will be a dedicated uh, Q&A at the end. So uh, if you don't have your question answered, stick around and uh, we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, don't worry about taking any notes if you're one of those types. Uh, I'll look to get a transcript of this done in the next few days. So uh, if you've registered through Readsy, you'll get a link uh, with all the uh, with the transcript in a few days. Okay, well, uh, I'll be sort of off stage left. If you need anything, let me know. Uh, but otherwise, I'll, I'll see you Thank next. you. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We're absolutely thrilled to be with, let, let me get up, my ah! friend and my sometimes editor, Gina Sorrell. This is her last book, Mothers and Other Strangers, which is wonderful. She has a new book that's coming out called Three Wise Women from HarperCollins, um, which is coming out in October, I believe. This is, whoops, I'm sorry, I can't do, this is my book. <laughs> With or without you, it was a Good Morning America pick, uh, a best book of the year from people, pop, sugar, a whole bunch of places, and I'm a New York Times bestselling author. So Gina and I are going to start out by telling our origin stories, because we had two very different ways of being published. And then we're going to segue into how you want to be published, how to get an agent, what your manuscript should look like, and a whole lot of other things. So my origin story started a long time ago, when I was in my 20s. And back then, I really believed that I would publish short stories first, and then I would get a book deal. Rejection, 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 no agent, rejection, rejection. I entered a writing contest, which you all should think about doing, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and I, to my surprise, I won first prize. Everything blew up. I started getting emails from agents saying, I want to represent you. I want to represent you. I want to represent you. And I knew nothing about it. And they said, but you have to have, an, you have, to have a novel. I had no idea how to write a novel. Back then, what happened was a publisher was interested, said, you know what, we'll buy her novel on the basis of this short story. I don't believe that happens now very often, but it happened back then. So suddenly I was a novelist with an agent and I had an experience that's very rare in that my first book blew up. They did everything. They did all the publicity. I was on TV. I was on radio. I was flown to different places. And I thought, it's always going to be like this. And <laughs> guess what? <It's> not. <laughs> I, my second book did okay, but not as well. And then my publisher went out of business. So I got a new publisher. They went out of business. And then I bounced around for the next few books from publisher to publisher. None of the books did very well. Um, they all got great reviews, except for one, <laughs> which deserved the bad review. But there were just no sales because there was no marketing, which is another thing we'll talk about. So there I was on my ninth book, which was Pictures Review, no sales, nobody knew who I was, I still had, I had gotten a new agent, um, but, you know, the chances of selling this book were, were nil, finally sold it, and the publisher rejected it on contract. The editor called me up and said, we don't like the book, we don't want to publish you, it's not special enough, so I was devastated, because if you get rejected on contract and it's your ninth book and nobody knows who you are, your chances of getting an agent are very slim. All of you out there who don't have agents, your chances are good because you're just starting out. <laughs> That's so good if you have nine novels. So I turned to the writing community, which is another thing we'll talk about. And I cried and well, actually I was hysterical. And my friend <laughs> said, we'll help you. And one of my friends had an editor at Gonquin and said, we're going to get you there. And 
they did. And the editor called me up and she was sort of talking about Algonquin in my book. And I'm an honest person. So I said, look, I have to tell you, I don't sell books. And she laughed and she said, well, honey, you will now. And they took that non-special book and they got it into six printings, six months before it was published. It became a New York Times bestseller its first week out. So my origin story is really a story of don't give up, be persistent. Now, I would I would love to have Gina tell her tell you her origin story for Mothers and Other Strangers. Hi, thank you, Caroline. So I'm Gina Sorrell, and that beautiful book, Caroline, hold up that book again. This is Caroline's <laughs> latest book. This is the oh, one. No, this is oh, no, your book. Your book. Hold your book. <laughs> this is the one. one. Okay. This is the one before it. I've got all the copies. I'm missing my other copy of With or Without You because I foolishly lent it to my father who's kept it for himself. So now I'm getting another copy. <laughs> Never loan your books. That's it. You just have to just give them to yes. people um, and then get more copies. So thank you. Yes, I am. Um, I uh, was a debut author in 2017, and I came to writing from a, a, an entirely different way. I had a background as an actor for uh, over 15 years, and then um, I, I wrote my own material. I, I worked in Second City. I worked in improv, and so for me, that was just it was all about story. And a story was the thing I was most attracted to. And then when I went out to Los Angeles, I for acting, I uh, decided that I was really bad at the whole waiting game and waiting for the phone to ring and that I should um, do something else that I've always loved with my time, the part I love the most about acting and that was telling stories. And so I went to UCLA and I did the UCLA extension program where I met Caroline. And uh, I started working on my first novel, Mothers and Other Strangers. <laughs> and, um, and Caroline was, has been, uh, if it wasn't for her, I would never have been published. That's the fact. So I had to do the whole thing that everybody's out there, you know, doing when you have a debut uh, book, and that is, I had to get an agent. I had to do that from scratch, and uh, I had a couple of false starts. You know, I had I was with a big agent, and then that didn't work out, and then I was with another agent, and that worked out, and then I would went out to all the big publishers, and then there were people who were um, liked the book, weren't sure if it would sell, you know, who was I? I didn't have a pedigree. It was lots of, you know, just the timing, those things you can't control. And so I got a lot of really wonderful, heartbreaking, heartbreaking uh, rejections that were so full of praise. Those are the worst kind and the best kind. And then I managed to get published at a small press. And I got published at that small press because um, I wouldn't give up and they were close to submissions and Caroline, um, you know, really, really championed my book and they opened the door and they agreed to read it. And then I got published. So that was my first book. And then my second book is uh, Three Wise Women that's going to be coming from HarperCollins next year. And that is with a new agent. And also we parted ways amicably that that is with a new agent and it's also with a big publisher and it's my first time doing that. But the interesting thing is every time I was querying, I was somebody who was read out of the slush pile and it was my query that attracted their attention. And so there really is something to be said for writing a great query and we're gonna talk to you about that here today. Okay, so the first thing we're going to break it down is how do you want to be published? Because there are different ways of being published. We're going to talk about self-publishing, traditional publishing, and something new, which is called hybrid publishing. There's also publishing without an agent. You have to Google publishers who don't require agents, and there are some that are pretty good. So first, we're going to talk about self-publishing. I'm going to say a little bit, and then Gina's going to say a little bit. Self-publishing works really well for fan fiction, romances, nonfiction books that have a platform attached. Um, it's changing in that it's getting more and more open. Places like Publishers Weekly, which is the um, the magazine for all of publishing, has 20 pages devoted to self-published books. However, they do review them, but you have to pay for the reviews. But even so, you want to because you want to be reviewed. Um, it's harder to get large sales. It's diff more difficult to get into bookstores unless you're willing to consign them. And it's tough to get traditionally reviewed. Gina, 
You want to add to that? Yeah, it is. I find, interestingly enough, I find that the pressure on those who self-publish is in many ways greater, um, which kind of seems counterintuitive because if you have a publishing house behind you, uh, you think that you're going to have really big sales. Um, but there seems to be an even greater expectation for those who self-publish to have really great sales if they ever want to then switch over in traditional publishing. So everything's on you. I mean, you're going to have to get the publicist. You're going to have to do your website. You're going to have to hold events and find out about events. And I think that, um, you know, as Caroline is saying, unless there is a platform that you have or an audience, you know, maybe everybody in your city is a huge fan of your uh, Instagram cooking shows that you do and now you have a chance to do a you know to make a to make a cookbook and you know that you're going to sell thousands of copies because you've got twenty five thousand followers on instagram i don't say that you should go for self-publishing first um you know and if people publish for different reasons and that's okay maybe you just want to publish because you want to publish maybe you want your friends and family to read something you know maybe you have a nice relationship with bookstores maybe the numbers of copies sold isn't the most important thing but I think that it has to be really specific to what your goals are. I don't think um, it should be viewed as, well, I'll do this for this one and then I'll go traditional for the next one. I think it, it's, it can be hard to switch back and forth. People do it, of course they do. But I, I think you know, if your dream is to see yourself on bookshelves, then try traditional publishing first. Uh, I'm just gonna bring up a comment here, which I think should ideally probably tee you into the next bit. Uh, Peter says, let's be honest here. To get an agent and to get published, you have to know someone and get really lucky. You no, know what? Pete, you don't. <laughs> you no, don't. you don't. That's it. That's you have to be fallacy. really good. You have to be really good. You have to good. be really good and you have to be really persistent. I know so, when Gina and I both know so many writers yeah. who have gotten up to 60 rejections from agents. Number 61, oh, yeah. they get an okay. Then they go yeah. on and they get 60 rejections from publishers. And then the 61st, they get published and all of a sudden it's a bestseller. Yeah. It's um, you know, persistence wins all the time and honing your craft. But that's not true. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. No, don't give up. And also your idea of who you know can be really different. I mean, you'd be surprised. Let's say that there's an author whose work you love and you can reach out to them or or maybe there's somebody who you met at, at a book event or maybe there's a teacher that you have a good relationship with or a workshop you attended. You could say in your query letter, you know, I took this really great workshop with this teacher uh, who maybe the agent knows or maybe, you know, they went to the same school. Right. And that's considered a connection. You know, we always think that connections are... Um, you know, that whatever, hey, you know, I'm related to famous, insert famous author here, but it, it's not, it can be that your tastes align. And so you can think of that as knowing somebody. Right, right, absolutely right. Okay, so the next one is hybrid. And I only actually know one publisher who does that now, but it's becoming a new model. It's one step up from self-publishing. There's one hybrid publisher in the United States called She Writes. You pay a fee, not as much as self-publishing, but they edit the book for you. They market the book for you. They get reviewed in high places, and that's not a bad thing. Um, and then there's traditional, which is this is where you don't pay for anything. Although a lot of authors will still hire an independent publicist or social media. So if you want to be traditionally published, that can be broken down in different categories too. And Gina is going to talk about this too. Um, most people dream of a big publisher like Random House, the $200,000 advance. But I have to tell you, that's not always what you want. I have many, many friends who got that $200,000 advance from Random House and the book did not sell in the first two weeks. It didn't make any lists. Sales were okay, but not great. And what Random House did and what many publishers do is then they turn their attention to another author. So your book does not get sales and it doesn't look great for you the next time around. Concurrently, I have friends who went with smaller publishers. Maybe they only got a $5,000 advance, but they very quickly made back that advance. Once you make back your, I guess I should explain what an advance is. An advance is the money that the publisher gives you when they accept a book. It's an advance to sales. You don't have to give that money back, but you will not get royalties, which is extra money every time you sell a book until you earn that back in sales. So sometimes smaller is better. Gina? Yeah, I mean, I had a tiny advance <laughs> for my, you know, 
<laughs> for my first book. And they, they were so nice. They said, look, we have very little money to offer you. And they were right. And I was just so <laughs> excited that I was going to get published. I took this tiny bit of money out to dinner. And um, but there's so many other things that they could offer me. They said, you know, you are clearly somebody who likes to be involved in the process, like having been an actor and an artist and someone who's created my own work for so many years. Um, I, I kind of wanted to still be involved and they were great about it. They said, you know, so you can you can sit in on those publicity conversations we're going to have and you can pitch in your ideas about book cover. And we're going to let you have the final say about it. So there were so many things that I could be a part of the process that it wasn't money, but it um, was really rewarding. And it gave me a sense of control of my book, which I'd spent so many years working on. I mean, by the time that the book was started to be written till it was published was, I think, seven years. Um, and so I had a, a lot of say, and that was really that was really great and rewarding. And we created a lot of events together, and I was able to make back my advance many times over, which was really a great feeling. Um, big publishers, Caroline, should I talk about that next? Yeah, go ahead because you have a big yeah, publisher so now. now it's now it's a different story. Now I'm now I have a book it's, that's at one of the big five, and I'm terrified and excited. <laughs> so you know it's. <laughs> So it's it's really exciting, and um, you know it's and it's interesting. Like I will, the advance can come out in many different ways. You know, a lot of publishers are now doing it in four parts. Some are doing it in five parts, which means you know you'll get some when you're when you when they say yes, we want to sign you, and then you'll get some when they um, ask for revisions, and then you'll get some when it actually gets published, and then you'll get some a year later in time for the paperback. Um, and I too have heard stories of people not making it back and people making it back and people making it back years later. I've heard of publishers caring about that and publishers not caring about that. I've heard of people who were you know, published during an election year and things went sideways and it's not their fault. Like I think it all depends on the circumstances, but it, it, is, it is a risk either way. And I think that's an important thing to remember is that right. even when you're getting published, it's a risk and there's really so little that you can control not to make you feel bad but just like you can only focus on the work and doing the best you can to get it out there we've got a question here from beverly if you find right. yourself offered a large advance you know lucky days uh but with one of the big publishing houses uh is it worth negotiating a lower advance so you can earn out quicker and with your agent like that no, don't do that, Beverly. If they're offering whatever money they offer you, take. The only time you want to renegotiate <laughs> if it's if it's not enough. Sometimes what publishers will do is they can write things into your contract. Like they can say, "Well, we're giving you this amount of money, but if you make the New York Times bestseller list, we'll give you an extra ten thousand um, dollars." You yeah. also have the opportunity to open more, to get more money if it goes to audiobook. That can be a nice sale, mm -hmm. or foreign sales is also more money. But don't negotiate a lower a lower advance. Gina, do you agree? No. Yeah, I know one person who did, <laughs> which was, really? but it's very rare, and they did it to they did it to get something else. They did it to get something else out of the contract, like so they wanted world rights, and they said, well, I don't want to give you world rights. I want to give you North American rights. How about you give me a little less? because they knew that if their agent sold world rights, that that would work towards their advance. I'm with Caroline though. I would just take the money that you're offered and say, thank you. Right. And I think it really, it really does repair. It does um, depend. There are some publishers that are e small press that are even less than 5,000. They're 500 yeah. or 1,500. And a lot of people I know who had their debuts were really happy to get 20,000 or 25,000, you know? It's, um, it's yeah. There's it's hard. It's hard to get the it's hard to get the big bucks, but it can happen. But just you just you want to get published and you want that thing to sell. <laughs> that's you know, right. That's the most right. Thing. We're we're going to talk more about publishing and what happens, but first I want to tell you uh, some things you can do to improve your chances of getting an agent. And Gina's gonna weigh in on this too. First, you can publish short stories and enter contests. Everyone should go check out Poets and Writers. It's Poets Ambersand Writers, because at the back of the magazine, they list contests and sometimes the prize is publication, sometimes the prize is $50,000. They also list places who are looking for things to publish. There are also a whole lot of places online 
that publish personal essays, um, Refinery29, The Millions, Scary Mommy, Salon, The Manifestation. The Holy Grail, of course, is something called Modern Love, which is in the Sunday New York Times. Um, Modern Love is the gift that keeps on giving because if they publish you, and they respond in a month, by the way, if they publish you, then you might be chosen to have a great actor read your story out loud in a podcast, Ooh, or you might good. be chosen to be in their HBO series. So that's so aim high. Get on social media. I saw that there were questions about this before. Yes, it's important to be on social media. And here's why, because every single agent, book reviewer, writer, whatever, is on social media. You don't have to do it for more than 10 minutes a day in the morning and at night. Choose two. Twitter is the best because it's so fast. Instagram is the next best. What you want to do is Google top agents on Twitter. It'll spit out a list. Go and follow them. When Before you follow them, make sure that your profile says novelist or writer it doesn't matter if you're published or not because what happens is you're going to follow them and they're going to say who the heck is this person and they're going to go to your profile and see oh it's a writer okay i'll follow them back your next thing that you want to do is you do not want to pester them about your book or ask a writing event instead think of yourself as a cocktail party if an agent you want posts oh i made spaghetti for dinner that's where you come in and say I have a brilliant spaghetti recipe. Can I give it to you? Or can you give me the recipe? You want to develop a relationship, but it's very, very important to do that. Yeah, and um, I think oh, you have oh, to also... Oh. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, I think it's, you know, I think it's also just really important to be true to who you are. Caroline is a natural at all of that on social media, just like a natural finding connections, able to, you know, have great conversations with everybody and engage and have it feel really easy and do it with like so many people at once. I uh, I find it really challenging. You know, I find it really hard. I, I like to take my pictures on Instagram. That's nice. You know, I'm better at Twitter now, but I don't spend a, a ton of time there, but I, not, I don't spend a ton of time engaging yet. But I will say, don't underestimate that you can just learn a lot from reading on social media. So somebody's book recommendations, I'll be like, that's a that's a genre that I love. Why don't I know this person? You know, and then I read the book and then I go to the back of the book and I see who they're affiliated with. And I think I did an event with that person. That's fantastic. Oh, that mean when I was looking for agents, I'd be like, I did an event with that person. They're a friend of that person. They're at the same agency. That might be a good agent. Therefore, I should reach out or try to find a way in or at least mention in my query letter. Hey, I did an event with your client. So I think there's always ways that you can use it that feel right and true to you. Because you know you don't want to come off um, you don't want to come off as inauthentic, right? Yeah, Gina is absolutely right. So I'm going to give you a list of some more places to look for agents. First, poets and writers. They have interviews with agents. Agentquery dot com. Agentquery dot mm -hmm. com. They have a search engine. You put in what genre you're in. You can say literary fiction, romance, sci-fi, whatever you're doing. It'll spit out a whole list of agents. You have to look through the agents and see, are they accepting new clients? You have to go to their website and see, do they have any clients you recognize? If they don't, you probably don't want to go with them. Um, how do they want to be approached? Every agent is different. Your goal is to have a list of 60. Go to bookstores or go to your favorite book. Look in the acknowledgments. Authors who love their agents always acknowledge them in the acknowledgement page. And that's what you want. Um, you want to aim for 60 and you want to try to do like three query letters a day while you're revising. So by the time your manuscript is ready, you can send all those query letters out at once. I would like to chime in and say that Reedsy, well, Yvonne on our team, has actually put together something similar. It's a directory of literary agents that she spent months vetting. Oh, that has great. all the same things, uh, but it's free, great. unlike some of the other services. So they'll show you the kind of genres they, they do kind of accept or have uh, in their list, uh, where they like to be contacted and links to their uh, manifest wish, uh, manuscript wish list and all that. So dropping a link to that one. Just doing a quick plug. 
No, that's important. That's great. That's, that's a great. really good to Resources know. are so helpful, you know, to find out who's looking. Um, and again, like, I, I think it's important to stress, you know, I, I've seen the comments too, like some people hate social media, other people, you know, are big fans of it. Again, you have to do what feels right to you. If you're someone who hates social media, you're going to have a terrible time on it. It's going to come across. It's going to be a waste of your time. You could be doing something else. So I think the thing is, ask yourself, what is the thing that you like to do that will help further your engagement with this community that you want to be a part of. You know, lots of writers are not on social media, but they can be good literary citizens. They can, you know, go to people's um, launches or they can even now we're doing so many of them on Zoom, they're easy to attend or, you know, get the word out uh, of other books that they like. You know, there is a way to, there is a way to still engage that feels that it's genuine to who you are. Uh, William asked for a bit of clarification. Do you mean send out 60 query letters at one time? Yeah, I do actually, because what happens with agents is when you send out a single query letter, they can take anywhere from six weeks to three months to six months to answer. So if you're doing, if you're querying one agent at a time, it's going to take you, it could take you years. If you query 60 different agents all at once, you're compressing the time it's going to take to get back to them. Agreed, and you can also, yeah, I mean, I think you can divide it up into three lists of 20 if you wanted. You know, you can have your A list and your B list and your C list. I mean, right. the reality is like, you know, they're, if they are not looking, you'll get a response pretty quickly. Thank you so much for submitting. We're not taking new people on. We wish you best of luck. Right. Boom. That, you know, yes. so, but you want to have 60 on your, you don't want to be spending two weeks in between the process then researching because it can feel discouraging to be doing that research after those initial rejections, you know. So it's great to have that list ready and then have your sort of your, your A and your B list. And if you're so lucky and you get it on the first one, you can write everybody back and say, hey, I got an agent. Don't bother sending those B ones out. I guess uh, the other <laughs> advantage of having it in certain waves is that if you're not fully sure whether the query's working, if you're like you, maybe you got your comps wrong or something, those are potentially 60 agents you could have burnt the bridges to. <gasps> That's right. That's right. That's so a good point, Mark. If, you, if you're 100% confident, uh, confident in your uh, query letter, that might make sense. But otherwise, yeah, like big old batches might be a good alternative. That's, um, you know, another thing that's important is what you want in an agent. That's why it's important to go to their website, to Google them, to find somewhere where they're talking. Because, you know, does an agent's personality fit with yours? Uh, do you want an agent who's just a shark who's going to sell your book or do you want an agent who's going to edit? Do they have a film group? Is that important to you? And of mm -hmm. course, most importantly is do you recognize their clients? Um, I just have to address, somebody did put a question up in here about do you need a finished manuscript before you query an agent? Yes, if you are a debut writer. Yes, you do. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I have heard of people who have um, been caught off, I'm just looking at some of the comments too, who've been caught off guard. Um, you know, I know of a writer who sent uh, sent a query letter out with three quarters of a manuscript finished, thinking it would take three more months. And so by the time it was finished, they were, you know, they were finished the manuscript, but they figured it was going to line up with the first person who responds. And someone wrote back right away and said, sounds amazing. Send me the whole thing. And then you don't want to have to say, give me three months, you know, so um, <laughs> it worked out for that person, which is great, but it doesn't always. So I say definitely wait until your manuscript's finished. And yeah, there are okay, so tons of, of agents, like some are really hand, hands on, some are really editorial, some are not, some are just transactional and they just take your book out and they, you know, it's about selling it. So it's really important to know what kind of, um, what kind of agent you personally need. You know, some people don't feel like they need a lot of editorial work. Some people, like myself, I love to have an agent who I can talk to all that stuff about. That's important to me. So I want someone yeah. who, you know, is able to do that kind of work, whether they need to or not, because I like to have those discussions. Okay, before we, I was going to talk about the query letter, but before that, I think we should talk about what an agent does for you. Why do you need one? First thing is agents schmooze. They have all the contacts. Your agent might mm -hmm. be best friends with your dream editor, right? Knopf or any other any other publisher. They can just pick up the phone and say, hey, you know what? I know you love books about cows and I have a great book here about 
of growing up on a farm. Um, agents do get you better deals. If you've ever seen a book contract, they're impossible to understand. I've published 12 books. I still do not understand my contract but I trust my agent to understand it. And there's always cross outs and additions of who gets what's rights and what, you, what you're attuned to. You need an agent to stand up for you. Agents also, sometimes they handle movie rights. Sometimes they handle rights of stuff that goes in a magazine. And usually when you get an agent, they will sit down with you and say, what's your dream publisher or your dream agent? You don't have to know, they know, but it's interesting in like what you want. They set up a list. Yeah, you about like 10, 10 Gina, and then you know yeah, I'm gonna let Gina talk about this part because I actually never had to do this because I got in the easy way. So Gina, talk about like the list. Yeah, the easy way by just being brilliant, and getting published over and over again in journals and newspapers. Yeah, the easy way, Caroline. <laughs> it's not so easy. Um, <laughs> that was yeah, that was twenty years ago. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, yeah, so um, so for getting an agent, so let's say the ideal situation, you know, you send out your first 20 query letters, you have people, they, they'll say on their websites, give us the first 10 pages, you know, submit the first chapter, send it in the body of an email or not as an attachment, like all that stuff's really important. Publishers Marketplace is a great resource where you can see all that information and they'll tell you. So following along, you, you send out your stuff, your dream agent writes you back and says, I love these first 10 pages, send me the whole manuscript and then you guys hit it off, it's great. They have all the kinds of things that you want. They become your agent. They will probably do a revision on your manuscript. They'll maybe do one, they'll maybe do two. Some are more hands-on than others. Some want it 85% ready. Um, that's from my experience. Like you'll think it's 100%, but they'll be like, we can tweak a little bit more. Um, but there's not really an agent I haven't found I think it's just doesn't exist anymore. Who's going to take you through the whole thing like an editor would, you know, like let's, let's work on this. Let's find out what the story is. So once you've worked on that together, maybe it's six months, maybe it's closer to a year. It's always longer. Everything I find in publishing is longer than you think it's going to be because you're not their only client. So you submit it, you're ready. Then you wait three months, you know, to get your notes. Then you do another pass and they'll take it out to when it's finally ready, ready to go. They'll take it out to publishers. And my experience has been that there'll be, a list that you come up together and yes your agent knows everybody and you don't <laughs> so you know i could only say things like i love these books i think that was a really great editor based on these books that i like i think that's a really great publishing house based on those books that i liked and then you know my agent can say oh that's this person or that's that person and you mm -hmm. know they'll put together a list of about 20 people and um and go through it with you it's usually just do you have any problems with any of them and you know for me the answer is no i love the people that my agent presented and then the full manuscript gets sent out the hope is that you hear back in about two weeks something you know something i'm enjoying it i need more time it's not for me um you know i love it are you talking to other people that kind of thing and hopefully you get an offer or get more than one offer if that happens, you'll have the opportunity to then talk to the different editors who are interested and see if you connect with them, what your style is like, whether it's a Zoom or a phone call. I always do mm -hmm. phone calls. So I'm too distracted, staring at other people's places like, oh, that's nice. You know, so like I, I just want to do a phone call. Um, and I ask them all those things. Like, what did you like about the book? What would you change? Um, where do you see it sitting on what shelf? You know, if you were what other authors do you think are comparable? Um, so if somebody says something totally off the wall, like you've written a romance and they're mentioning thrillers the entire call, you're like, okay, that doesn't seem like a good fit to me. Or if they're like, it's great, but it just needs to be more tragic. We have more tragedy in every chapter. And you're like, oh, it's actually a comedy. You know, then you can see whether or not it's a good fit. You can have that conversation afterwards with your agent and you'll decide who is the best, who is the best person for this book. Not just who you like the best, who's the best person for this book. And ideally, where is the who's the best person at the best publishing house that you can see yourself building a career at? Um, then you accept it, and the, the deal making and negotiating starts happening with your agent doing that for you. And at that point, from my experience, it's just been to say thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes, yes you want an agent. I bow down behind this in front of my yeah. agent all the time. We've had some questions I've seen in the chat about nonfiction. I think we should, oh, do agents know if an agent no. charges you, run, 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 run. No. They make their they money when you make your money. 
No. I want to talk about nonfiction because some people have asked. Memoirs, mm -hmm. you do not need a proposal for, as far as I know, because memoirs operate the same way that novels do. They have the same sort of structural components where you want to be invested and on and on. Uh, you want the whole memoir. Nonfiction book like how to get published would need a proposal. I'm not the best person to talk about proposals for nonfiction. All I know about them is you need elements like what would be your marketing plan? Who's your audience? What books are comparable to yours and why? Why is your book different or better? Um, I, I'm sure Rizzi must have something about nonfiction books and how to market them. Oh, I honestly don't I'll know. Do you, stuff. Martin? I bet you do. <laughs> Do you have anything to say, Gina, about- Oh, I thought Martin was pitching in there. I heard his voice. Oh no, I just said we have some links. I'm gonna drop some in the comments. Great, oh, good. great, great. Yeah. great. That's no, I, really, I'm, really I'm good. not, uh, I can't offer too much on nonfiction because I write fiction. Yeah. And so I know that it is a different process and you can do a proposal. I've only ever worked, I'm gonna answer some of these questions in the chat. I've only ever submitted when I've had a full completed manuscript. Have I done the work over with an editor before contacting an agent? Absolutely. Um, do debut novels get on the bestseller list? Yes. There's always a lot of excitement for debut novels because somebody's discovering somebody. You know, it was the same thing when I was an actor. Somebody wanted to be the first agent to find you, the first director to use you. You know, there's a lot of promise and potential there, right? So that's actually a great place to be. And that was something I never knew as a debut author. Um, in terms of how do you find out who uh, an agent works with, you know, we mentioned Publishers Marketplace, you know, they have, a, it's something, a service that you can join, you can go online and you can type in this agent and then it'll show you the deal that was done with the editor at the house. And that's really helpful because you'll see, oh, it's this person at Random House. Oh, okay, that's great. Then you search that editor and you see who else they've done. Oh my gosh, they've done all my favorite books this year. Or wow, they're fantastic at literary fiction. And so then you start to get a sense of, you know, what their, uh, what their tastes are, and that can be helpful too. Um, I have somebody said, you know, I've written hundreds of query letters and I, I haven't gotten um, an agent. No, I, I understand that feeling. You know, I wrote so many query letters for to get my first agent. I think I, I think I wrote, I think I wrote sixty or sixty-five you know, and it took a year, <laughs> which is, it's a lifetime, but I had so much shame. I thought really I was the only one. And the nice thing is, is as you get to know other people in the industries, you realize that that story is all too common. You know, someone's like, oh yeah, I didn't find an agent for my first book or my second book. It was my fourth book that got it. You know, those things aren't uncommon. You know, I was like, oh, it took me seven years to get published. And I heard the people say, oh, that's great. It took me 10 or it took me 12. It, it just takes a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, just you can't give up. If it really matters, just, you know, keep on it. I see a lot of questions about what writers have to do about publicity. Um, do we do it or does the publisher do it? So Gina and I want to talk about that. Um, if you have a traditional mm -hmm. publisher, they're supposed to do the publicity. When you go with a publisher, um, different publishers do different things. Um, I'm with Algonquin Books and they have fabulous publicity. They send all their authors on tour and pay for it. They do a lot of marketing, they do a lot of stuff. Um, other publishers do not. They just do basic stuff and send out to, re they will send out to reviewers and all publicity actually happens six to eight months before your book is out. You don't want to wait. However, I believe, and I think Gina believes too, that authors have to also step in and help. So what can authors do? Well, you can write personal essays. You um, do a lot of Instagram stuff, a lot of Instagram ads for your book. And your friend on Instagram is actually the hashtag. Do a Google search for book reviewers on Instagram and hashtag them all. Put up a lovely picture of your book and say, coming July 2022, and then have like you're allowed 30 different hashtags just to get attention out. A lot of people will hire an additional publicist even with great publicity, um, because you can always, because, you know, book author, author publishers are really, really busy and any extra help is great. Um, a good book publicist can cost you anywhere from 
$5,000 to the medium, which is a whopping $25,000. And you have no guarantees in that. I don't recommend the $25,000 unless you happen to be rich because it's too much of a gamble for a writer. So much money. Gina, I know you can weigh in on this. Yeah, I think uh, publicity is a, publicity's a really tricky one. I hired a publicist for my first book. It was a really small press and they were really honest. Like we can do this, this and this. And I was like, okay, that's all they can do. You know, there's a couple of people that were running that press. And, um, and I knew that I had to have a wider reach. So I hired a publicist and she was terrific. And I was able to work with her, as I mentioned, and also with the, um, with the publishing house. And we did all the things, you know, I wrote letters to, I, I had really actually really nice uh, stationery printed up off of Etsy and, you know, and I had, a, I made myself a cute logo. I did the name of the book. I said when it was coming out and then I hand wrote cards to like all these bookstores. I think there was like a hundred bookstores in the States. And then I wrote to like, you know, a hundred bookstores in Canada and to like authors that I admired, I wrote to them and I sent these out everywhere, just telling them about the book, it was coming, could I send them a copy or could my people send them a copy? If they couldn't afford to send them a copy, like let's say we'd max those out, I bought additional copies and did it myself. I walked around to bookstores and I gave people copies and then they would read it and it worked. Like I had somebody who read my book and who loved it and then contacted me and said, hey, do you wanna do an event? So, you know, then I, that was my first event and it was at a bookstore in Michigan called Literati, which is a lovely bookstore. And I drove to Michigan with my sister and I did an event there, but then I could write to other bookstores and say, hey, I just did this event at Literati. And, you know, sort of feel very important about myself. And then people are like, oh, well, that's great. You wanna do an event here? Sometimes you need to do it with other people. And now on Zoom, you know, you can get together three debut authors, four or five debut authors, and you can do a whole night about what it's like to be a debut author. You know, you can come up with your own themes, you know, like um, published after 10 years or, you know, the whatever, top six under 60, top seven under 70, you know, create your own categories <laughs> and, and, get the, and get the word out. So I think there's a lot that can be done on your own. And I, I think that if you don't have the budget to hire your own publicist, then there's lots of ways to piecemeal it. You know, maybe you can do a trade with somebody. You've got uh, so many people, like I had a whole other career. I have a whole other career outside of writing. So maybe there's somebody who, you know, you can offer something to. Um, you know, I work in branding. And so I could, maybe I could offer somebody like, hey, you've got a company, do you want me to write some copy for you? And maybe you can give me a day of your time to do some publicity. Like there's, there's ways to go about getting it done, even if you don't have the funds. But I think um, I think it's important. And then at a bigger house, you know, the hope is that they have the resources to be able to do that, so you don't have to. But you're also going to be one of 100 authors, so it's a lot of books that come out in one year, right? And the big mm -hmm. publishing house has all these different imprints. So will you get the attention? Will you not? You still have to do a lot of that hustle on your own. It's also important yeah, to say that you really. You really need to be part of the writer's community. There are places online, binders for writers is a great resource. You can Google different ones because you need to know other writers. They will help you. All writers try to help each other. And if they don't, well, there's a special circle in hell for them. Um, respond to writers on, even if you go on Twitter and just to tweet to a writer you admire and say, I loved your book. Thank you for writing it. They'll remember that. Carolyn mm -hmm. C., who was a great, great writer and a great book critic, told me that I should write a lovely letter to a writer every month, just not asking for anything, but just telling them how much I love their book. That's how you build a writer's community. That's part of it, and that's important. Um, I have a I question. Should, does that too, yeah. I guess we should take questions now. Martin, yeah. do you have questions? Cool. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. So there've been some great questions coming in already. Yeah. Uh, what? One thing that I want to clear up for a bit. Caroline spoke earlier about hybrid publishers, and there are a handful of great ones. She writes, I believe you've worked with before, uh, and they sound great. Um, there's one here in the UK that's sort of uh, crowdfunded, the Unbound, and I know them to be quite good. The big right, distinction right. for these is that you need to make sure that they are very picky about what they publish. Because the trouble with hybrid is that vanity presses have picked up on the term as well, and they'll call themselves hybrid publishers, uh, which is really muddying the waters in a, in a, in a big way. Um, so you really need to be careful about 
you know, what exactly you're paying for, what they're paying for. Because sometimes these vanity presses calling themselves hybrids will go, oh yeah, don't worry, you're going to pay for half, we'll pay for half, your half is $7,000. Uh, and of course, $7,000 more than covers their side of it and uh, gives them some profit after which there'll be zero incentive for them to actually pick anything up. So if you are tempted to go down that route, and I think that majority of the places that ask you to pay for publishing are scammers, uh, have a look at the books they've published. Go on Amazon, see what books they put out. If they've got no reviews, if their sales ranks are abysmal, if their cover looks terrible, then chances are they're just taking your money, uh, mm -hmm. giving it to an editor who could be literally anybody, uh, slapping a cover they've taken three minutes to put together and, you know, cash your check. I'm oh, sorry, I guess, try again. If you've got another book, send that to us. We'll happily take your money again. Um, but, Martin? Yep. There's a couple of things here just that I'd love to add. Oh, hi, fellow Canadians. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a couple of things uh, that I'd like to add that are just, just to clarify, because I know how confusing it can be just in terms of the order of things. So just to recap, obvious stuff, it's, you know, first you write the manuscript, then yes, I would recommend if you can get it edited professionally, then you query the agent. Then if you get the agent, your agent, and you talk about the kind of publishers you want to work with, uh, you would do the research once you're agented about your kind of editors at those publishing houses that you want to go to, and they will submit to those people. You don't have to query editors. You don't query editors at publishing houses. That's something in here. You don't do that. No, you never reach out to those people. You don't pay publishing houses either. You know, if you're self-publishing, there's a fee to get your book out into the world. That's something different. Uh, but hopefully that clarifies the chain of events for people. Uh, okay, I'm just... Sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to mention that um, it's really important that your manuscript be dressed for success. Um, I've gotten a lot of manuscripts from people where they use colored fonts. Don't do that. <laughs> or they use fancy fonts. Don't do that either. It'll irritate the agents. No pictures. No pictures unless it's a, you know, a picture book or you need photographs. That goes in a separate file. Keep the same readable font. Times New Roman is good. Garamond is okay. Nothing fancy. Double space your manuscript. Page number on the upper right hand corner. Left hand corner should be your name slash the name of your novel. Um, margins, decent margin, inch and a half on the left, inch on the right. Appearances count. And would you believe it? We've got an article for that as well. Uh, I'll drop that one in the <laughs> oh. link as well. You can. It'll take you through all of those things. Uh, tell you exactly. You know, what font size to use, what your margin should be, whether you should be indenting at the beginning of Great. paragraphs. Uh, you can even download a template. Uh, so if you're using MS Word, all you need to do is load that up and then you can just start typing into that. Um, but yeah. Martin? Yes? What I think, someone's wants to know, can you contact a publishing house directly? No, and I think that's where the confusion comes in, is when I'm talking about editors at a publishing house, they're sort of one and the same. You think, oh, I'm going to go here to Random House. Betty Smith is the person who's at that, you know, she's the editor for Random House. Like they come as a package and your agent contacts them, you don't contact them. If they are small presses and they'll say on their website, you don't need an agent to submit to us, go ahead, then you can contact them directly. Uh, cool, there's a question here, oh, I've just about lost it. Uh, Kevin asks, uh, should an author focus on contacting agents in the same region or country as them? Not necessarily. Doesn't matter. Sometimes it's a plus if you're from a different country, because that makes for a good media hit. You know how interesting it is in America, where publishing the debut of an author from um, Europe or wherever. Uh, it's all but, global now. It's all global, and yeah. all, look at us we're all around the world. I don't think it matters. But I guess like your agent will probably know the publishers in their region best, so. Yeah. The, the the effectiveness of their schmoozing uh, is probably, you know, if you want to publish in America, maybe an American agent's better. Though last week, uh, talking to our, our guest then, he says, yeah, there's a lot of sort of crisscrossing happening. Yeah, the there's a lot. Uh, okay, let's see what other questions. Uh, one other thing that gets brought up quite often, and I think someone has asked that before, uh, is the idea that everyone's like worried about once they start querying that, they may lose their, their manuscript or they may have this, this story stolen. Everyone 
a lot of people keep asking us, should I get my thing copyrighted before I send it out, before I send it to an, uh, to a Reedsy editor even? No, it's, it's, that happens in the movies and the film industry. That's where you do want to register your script and your idea. But publishing is still very much a gentleman's and gentlewoman's and gentle person's business. Um, plus, you have a record of your manuscript in your computer, which is probably dated. Um, there's, I don't know any time where that has happened. A few times that it has happened usually happens after a book is published and all of a sudden there's a real brouhaha where somebody plagiarized from somebody else's already published book and that's a really bad thing. And then the person who did it never gets a book deal yet. So you don't have to worry. <laughs> and also, I, I see one of the questions here, somebody wants to know if they should personalize their query letters. Absolutely. You know, there's there's a real form to query letters. I know, Carolyn, do you want to speak to that quickly? Because I know you've got it down pat, but you really do want to personalize your query letters uh, to yeah. each agent. Yeah, you want your query letter to pop with personality. Um, what I always do is like you direct it to a single person in the literary agent. You have to know mm -hmm. something about them because you don't want your query to sound like you're sending the same one to 8,000 agents. So a good first paragraph would be something like, Dear Ellen Levine, I recently read an interview with you and poets and writers, and I loved when you said that writers are like, pasta, whatever she said. Or you can say, Dear Ellen Levine, recently I read this book and I just loved it. I didn't want it to end. So I looked at the acknowledgement pages and I saw that you were acknowledged. Because I love this book so much, with this in mind, I'm hoping that you will take a chance on me, a debut author. So you've already sort of schmoozed yeah. the agent, made them know that you like them, you want them. Second paragraph is a very brief tease about your book. Third paragraph is the about me. This isn't just, oh, I'm, you know, I'm Caroline Lovett. I've written 12 novels and two were New York Times bestseller. That's like, those are the facts. You want to add things like, say if you've written a book about horses, that's where you would say, I learned to ride, re, to, uh, ride a horse when I was two and <laughs> I, I own three horses and they live in my backyard in New York City. You want stuff, you know, just imagine that you're on NPR. You want interesting stuff that people are going to want to listen to. They don't care that much about what you did as much as they care about what you can talk about. And the last paragraph is simply, I follow directions. Every agent is different. This is where you're going to say, as indicated, I'm sending you the first chapter. Or as indicated, I'm sending you the whole manuscript. Or as indicated, I'm sending nothing but the query letter. But you want to try to get your personality in there. So... One of the things yeah. people have been asking is whether you are submitting, uh, how you're actually submitting the query letters. Uh, I imagine most of them have an electronic form on their site these days. Oh, yes. Yes. Email. Yes. Email. All email, just about it. And some will say, you know, if you're querying us, only query us one at a time. Wait till you hear back from us. And others will say, even if you query one of us, if it's not right for us, we pass it on to the others, you know. Mm -hmm. um, wait to hear two to six weeks. Please cut and paste your first 10 pages in the document. But yeah, it's um, they're very specific about it. It's on their websites. It's you know, it's on other resources like we've mentioned, like Poets and Writers or Publishers Marketplace or Agent Query. It'll tell you um, how to go about reaching them. Yeah, I think yeah, all agencies do have you know the submission requirements, and I guess because right. you they're seeing whether they want to work with you, and if you're not the sort of person who can read a simple instruction then they're really not going to like chasing you for your pages or like dealing with you in any other way. And also because, you know, they're getting about 300 queries a week, some of them, right? right? So it's their right. assistant that's going and saying, who's this person? It's not How do they know him? You know, then do they have the pages? And that's, yeah. Also, it's important to know that a lot of time the agent herself or himself or themselves is not reading your query first. Their assistant is. And these assistants might be 19 years old, just out of college, and they want to do a good job. And it's easier for them to say no to a query because then they won't look stupid than to say yes and give it to the agent who might say, this isn't what we publish at all. Why are you giving me this? Yeah. And so yeah, don't and again, take like that personal just, experience. Take no, and the personal experience that you have is really important. You know, somebody asked, do I include my website? Sure, if you've got it, include a link to your website. If you're writing about horses and you had a background as an equestrian writer, include that. You know, I think too many writers think, 
they only want to know about my writing. No, they want to know about your life and how it applies to the project that you're querying about. So, you know, if you're a banker, or let's say, you know, or let's say you're a, you're a, or, or you're a homemaker or whatever it is, if your career before you're writing, if that career informs what the project that you're submitting, that makes you an expert. You know, don't undervalue your life experience. You know, your mm -hmm. life experience makes you an expert in the subjects that you're writing about. So include that. People want to know who you are and why you're writing what you're writing. I've got right. a question here that a few people have asked. Can I self-publish a book first and then send queries to agents? You can, yeah. but they're not going to be, but they may not pay attention unless you have a million save reviews on Amazon. I know Lisa Genova, who wrote Still Alice, which became a very famous movie. She had to self publish that book because she couldn't get a publisher, couldn't get an agent. It had something like 2,000 reviews on Amazon, and they came to her. Um, you know, you can, but it's much better to try to get an agent first before you self-publish, I believe. Yeah, I think so too. I think I think you could you can always do it. I know of an author who did it and same thing. Her book was hugely successful. You know, um, people really liked it. And so she had another one and she's like, I don't want to do it myself again. Like I think it's okay, but you gotta be prepared for it's just more pushback. But yeah. it can it, it can be done. And also let's you probably if it's a different thing, like if you published a nonfiction independently, that's fine. Self-published it. Now you want a fiction, you know, traditionally published. That's a whole other genre. That's totally fine. Somebody keeps asking if being a teenager will affect their publishing. I don't think so, but I don't know. So I think you can get an agent and then your agent will navigate that for you. So if you're a teenager and you've got a great book and you want to try and get an agent, tell them you're a teenager when you when you query, let them know. There was that kid who wrote Aragon. I think that was the big story 20 years right, ago. He was like that's 14 right. or something. That's right. That's right. Although I say kid, he's older than me now, almost certainly. Um, <laughs> the thing that I would say I'm about, self ages, yes. <laughs> about the self publishing from what I've heard from other um, agents and such, is that they will be a little bit cagey. As you said, there are examples. Hugh Howey, um, the guy who wrote The Martian, they self-published and it was enormous. And of course, they're going to want to pick it up. But... And it, for other people who self-publish, you know, the, you could basically query it to people and you go, I've self-published this book. It has sold nothing. Would you like to make this money? And then they <laughs> might be cagey. Or if you do quite well and sell like 4,000 copies, some of them might not be entirely sure whether you've entirely tapped the market for that particular title. Um, but the one thing we've heard is that if you have been successful, like they'll definitely want to see your next book. That's yes. right, Gina. No, I think this another question is about next book types of books is I think this does apply. Um, someone's asking, I think this does apply to all kinds of books. You know, this is a process. So you'll be querying when you're querying, if you're a children's author, you'll be querying agents who represent children's authors. That's where the research comes in. So the process is the same. Um, it's just finding the agent that does that. Not all agents represent everything. And that's the other thing they'll tell you on their website. I don't represent science fiction. You know, or I only represent science fiction. And so know your audience before yeah. you query them. Jim asks, do agents keep track of the they rejected? No, oh, yeah. do not. Yeah. Do not requery them. You will get you can you will get like three different kinds of responses from agents. The first will sound like a form letter, which will say you know didn't connect or this is a tough market. That means they probably didn't read it. So just move on to the next. Do not requery. If you get a if you get a response to your query that says you know. I really wanted to love this more, but what stopped me was your ending. I sort of wanted this to happen in the ending, so I have to regretfully decline. That is where you can, you know, you can email that agent and say, I thought about what you said. If I rewrite my ending, would you be willing to take another look at it? Then they will. But don't requery. Just Yeah, I would requery and I would use your real name. Uh, oh, it just came up. Sorry, yeah. sorry, that's what today. Yeah, I would use your real name. <laughs> the nice thing is, let's say they pick you, and then for whatever reason you think, oh, I want to use a different name. They'll ask you, like, now that you're publishing this, are you going to still use this name, or is there another name you want to use? You know, but they want to look you up and see who you are and what you've done. You know, like maybe you've written some great articles, or maybe you, you know, you've hiked a mountain that nobody else hiked or something. You know, and are you just are you a real person? So. I wouldn't worry about I wouldn't worry about that stuff. And yes, I do say that agents keep their queries because honestly, 
Um, the agent that I'm with now is somebody that, you know, I had been querying for years for different projects. And uh, and she remembered and I remembered, you know, I remembered every time she wrote me back and was like, this is great, but not for me or this isn't quite there yet or keep at it. You know, that's a, it's a that was a long process, but it, it really worked out. So um, they do remember. Uh, we've got a question. I'm a 65 year old first time author. Do I have a chance in hell? Yes. Absolutely. Have you read care about uh, your where the Crawdads Sing? Right. Yep, you absolutely do. There are like lots of Gail Godwin is really famous in America. She's 80 something year old. Um, you they don't agents do not ask how old are you <laughs> before they take you on. Either do publishers. They're looking for a good story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm gonna do a couple more questions. I've just noticed that it's um uh popped uh over nine o'clock where I am, so it's uh, after four. Oh, uh, don't know what happens there after four, but um, um, yeah, someone asked something about literary fiction because I guess in a lot of the other ones we have, you know, we do talk about you need to know sort of what your genre is, maybe so you and I kind of identify, you know, that you know what your book is, where it might shelve. As literary fiction authors yourself, like, do you ever have to like say, oh, this is a literary fiction novel, or do you just say this is the book? It's, you know, the, the, those are genres that which usually are marketing decisions. Um, usually what they mean by literary fiction is that the language is also really painstaking, painstakingly done and that it's beautiful and that there's a lot of layers to it. Commercial fiction is, you know, it can be less or so. But again, it's, I have friends who are literary, who consider themselves literary writers and their book is marketed as a commercial book. I have friends who thought they were writing YA and to their surprise, their book was published as an adult novel and vice versa. It's sort of, I wouldn't really think about that too much because it really is, in my experience, it's the publisher's call. I think so too. And I think if you can, you know, hopefully in your query letter where you're saying, you know, um, I've always admired, you know, I'm writing to you. I love your list. I see you represent author A, B, and C pretty much based on those novels that you're mentioning will give the... Yeah, well, yeah, we'll give the we'll give the agent an idea. You know, I too am writing a book that it's about blah blah blah, or I too am a literary fiction writer or a writer who writes in the sweet spot between both literary and commercial fiction. Um, somebody wants to know if there are other work counts, like their published work, like plays and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it matters. I think if you've produced work, you want to share it. Absolutely. Right. Uh, books of short stories, I guess. Is there much, um, more, much more, less of a market? Yeah, I can't speak too much to this, less unfortunately. Sorry, Alex. Yeah, I mean, people do love short stories. Mostly what they love now are linked short stories, mm -hmm. which means if you have the same characters in one or two of the stories or if it's about the same town, when, you, when you're when you doing, when you go to agent query, put in short story and it'll yeah. tell you like which agents like that. Yeah. Uh, another one, Are there interest, is there interest in novellas these days? Oh, I don't well, we're gonna, know. We're going to find I out. Know. I have a friend who's got a fantastic novella out there that's being read right now by agents. And so I'm really hoping so. Um, I think there's more interest than there was before. So I think that's, or at least it's come around again, because their response has been that people said, yes, send it to me. Um, and really great people. So that tells me that they wouldn't ask for something to spend their time reading something if they didn't think that they could publish it so let's hope so the books have gotten a bit shorter so mm -hmm. you know Good I question. Possible. I want, How do you find I want to just sorry oh, I'm sorry Martin <laughs> I want to just do another plug for Reezy and for Gina and I these are our whoops these are our <laughs> books <laughs> if you buy them from all your, your favorite bookstore and you send your receipt to martin at reezy.com um, Gina and I are going to choose a few people to receive a surprise which could be a signed book or it could be a book plate or whatever else um, and I also want to say that both Gina and I work as developmental editors on Reezy which means we know what kinds of things agents and editors are looking for and when we read your manuscript we will help you get it in shape we can't guarantee what to do that you You'll get publication, but we can certainly help. Yeah, of course. Uh, I, anyone who signed up, there'll be a follow-up email uh, with the links to Caroline and Gina's oh, great. Uh, Reedsy page. Oh, great, 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 great. Also, if you just Google their names in Reedsy, uh, you'll find them and you can send them a request. Yes. 
Um, but uh, yeah, are there any specific types of books you're looking for, specific types of projects you guys are looking for? Um, any kind of fiction is good for me. I'm, I'm not good with sci-fi or fantasy. Um, I'm not the right person for YA or children's books. And I think that's about it. Yeah, likewise, I'm the same. Uh, you know, I'm I'm open, but I don't. Want, I'm not the right person for your nonfiction query proposal. That's yeah. And and again, I would be. Uh, you can. There are some great author. There's some great authors and some great editors who can really help you with sci-fi or uh, with YA. I wouldn't. Don't spend your money on me doing that. <laughs> like I'm not the person for it. <laughs> that's the right person. That's the other thing about yeah, doing that research. But yeah, I am, you know, I have a sweet spot for people who are debut novelists who are going through that process. I know how, I know how important that is to you. I know how hard that can be. I know how trying that can be. And, um, and I just know like just, uh, yeah, that it's so important to just to keep doing the work and to not lose faith and to, right. you know, yeah, not so think that there's only one way to do it either. That's really important. Yeah. So there's one thing I think to take away from today's session is that you know, if you're not hearing back after five queries, you know, it might not be that your book is wrong. It's just that you haven't queried enough people. Right. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, I want to thank you both so much. Uh, there's going to be an edited transcript available. If you're still here, for some reason, this thing hasn't ended still. But uh, uh, if you are still watching, I dropped a link to the transcript uh, over there in the comments. Thank you again for turning up.